Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started in 2020 uh, with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to host uh, today's guest at our most recent SALT conference in New York a few weeks ago. But our goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And if you're new to SALT Talks, or if you're not new, you know that we have been focusing a lot on the digital asset space and the crypto space. And, and today's guest, Jeremy Allaire, uh, is somebody who has been in the space since 2013 uh, and whose company and, and one of the assets, especially that they have created is on fire. But Jeremy is the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle, which is a global financial technology firm that enables businesses of all sizes to harness the power of stable coins and public blockchains for payments and commerce. Uh, founded in 2013, Circle is the pioneer of the USD coin or USDC, which is the fastest growing, fully reserved, and regulated dollar stable coin. And we'll get uh, more into that about why people are looking into USDC as an alternative to the existing uh, options a little bit more uh, during the talk. But governed by the Center Consortium, led by Circle and Coinbase, USDC's market cap is today, I believe, more than $33 billion, uh, with over $800 billion in transaction volume. I believe since we put together this bio, that has gone up to about $1 trillion. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, Jeremy. Right. But Previously, Mr. Allaire co-founded and led multiple uh, global internet technology companies with thousands of employees, hundreds of millions of, of consumers served, and multiple successful public offerings on NASDAQ. He's provided expert testimony on digital assets and monetary policy before the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, and he has been named to the IMF High Level Advisory Group on FinTech. He also met Anthony, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, who's our host, uh, who's the founder. Are you going to mention I got fired from the White House, Davos. Darcy? What'd you say? No, are you going to mention that I got fired from the White House? Or I don't think it's particularly until... relevant for this talk, but I can definitely okay. bring it up uh, okay. just to give everybody full context. That Anthony did spend 11 days in government while while uh, Jeremy not, It's nonstop, Jeremy. You don't, you don't Congress, even uh, think. Anthony With these millennials, it's nonstop, Jeremy. It's nonstop. <laughs> all right, keep going, John. But that, that's about it, Anthony. I think we covered all the bases there. I'll let you and Jeremy take over and I'll, I'll pipe in with some questions as we get going. So, so Jeremy, we, we have a lot in common because we're old war horses at this point in our lives. And we're traditionalists uh, by nature in the world of finance. And we're watching some contemporaries of ours are probably a couple of years older than us, guys like Jamie Dimon and Larry Fink. Uh, Jamie Dimon saying that Bitcoin is uh, essentially worthless. Larry Fink says, well, I'm more in Jamie's camp. He said that uh, recently. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your background leading up to the founding of Circle and why you have traversed into this realm, the land of worthlessness, which I also happen to be in, Jeremy. And then we'll get into why you and I think that we're not in the land of worthlessness, that we're landed in the land of opportunity. But go ahead. Yeah, no, th thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be having this conversation. So, yeah, I mean, look, my background is is not in traditional finance. Um, my background is in internet technology platforms, software platforms. Um, I had the I had the benefit of um, you know getting involved with the internet around 1990, and you know what 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 captured my imagination in the early 90s was you know, the, the, the ability to connect a computer to this global network and to be able to communicate instantly with anyone else connected to that network. And I was, you know, basically became obsessed with this idea of open networks, of decentralized infrastructure, and what that could do in the early days, what I was excited about, what that could do to disrupting how information and communications work. And so, you know, as the, as the web uh, as, as the World Wide Web became a technology in the mid '90s, um, I, uh, I I became you know very interested in how that could actually replace 
how traditional software was created and distributed. You know, back then, you know, you used to get software on a disk and you put it in your Windows machine and install it. And I, I, I was of the view that Basically, anyone with a, a computer could connect it to the internet and could create pieces of software that could be accessed by anyone with a web browser anywhere in the world. That sort of idea of a web application invented technology to help make it possible for really anyone with, you know, I, I like to say, a thousand bucks in an idea to build a global on, interactive online service um, and, and really followed that theme for, for many years, which is open networks, open standard protocols, decentralized infrastructure, sort of, the, the, I think of it as like the DNA of the internet that has enabled all these massive global network effects to happen in, in information, communications, media, telecommunications, software distribution, the ability for any anyone who creates a product anywhere in the world to find a customer anywhere in the world, all these sort of things have happened from that kind of model. So went through building products in software distribution, content distribution, television distribution, um, all built on open decentralized infrastructure on the internet. I happen to also have spent my undergraduate work studying global political economy, international macro issues. I was very interested in sort of, sort of how the world's economic systems work. And after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, I became you know, obsessed with the history of money, history of central banking, the international monetary system just became things that I wanted to better, more contemporaneously understand. And, um, and, and then really in, in 2012, kind of went down the rabbit hole in crypto. And I think for me, what I saw was the sort of seeds of the next logical infrastructure layer of the internet, um, a, a layer of infrastructure that could enable value to be represented, value to be exchanged um, in the same way that we have these open permissionless networks for information and data and content communications and software and everything else, that we it would become possible to do that with value. V value represented as a, as a new non-sovereign value that was algorithmically issued, like a Bitcoin, I thought was very compelling. But I also thought that you could build on top of these networks representations of fiat value and, and enable those to be transactable with the same ease that we can kind of quote unquote transact information. So that's what kind of led me to this. And so I would just say the high level is, I just look at this as the next logical infrastructure layer of the internet. It's the, the next, it's sort of the internet actually becoming the substrate of economic systems, of governance systems. It's an inevitable future in, in many respects. And I think we're we're just seeing this, you know, hive of, of creativity helping to build it out now. Okay, it's uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, I'm, 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 I'm totally with you. You're also doing something that I think is, um, is helping the entire crypto ecosystem. Uh, you're basically, I guess, you know, I would say that Circle is probably best known for uh, being the creator of USDC with the second largest stablecoin in the market with around $33 billion. Uh, there's some people here that are listening that don't know what a stable coin is. So let's start there, Jeremy. Tell us what a stable coin is. Tell us why USDC is so important to the crypto ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. So the, 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 the phrase stable coin is something that got kind of got applied to this category. There's not something that we um, we, we sort of embrace, but 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 basically, um, the way I look at this, and and actually it has to do with the way we've designed USDC. Is if you think about the way the internet works today, um, you know there are these like the protocols that allow computers to talk to each other. So like the the World Wide Web is a protocol called HTTP. You've probably seen it. People put it in URLs, you type it into a browser. But basically, that is a way for one computer to connect to another computer and exchange content in, in a structured way. Um, what's so powerful about it is that any computer in the world can connect to the internet, connect that protocol, and basically exchange information without an intermediary, directly, very efficiently. We have other protocols like 
you know, internet email, we all can have email servers, we can all have different email service providers, but everything can connect point to point. You can connect and exchange a message. That exists for so many other things now, like when you when you do a, a FaceTime audio call or you know a, a Zoom call, like what we're doing here, we're actually like leveraging these these sort of open protocols. So the idea was, why can't there be a protocol for dollars on the internet, where anyone that connects to it can exchange dollars in the same way we exchange a JPEG photo or a piece of data or other things. And the, the power of that, of course, is that once you have something like that, anyone who creates a, a, a commerce product, a financial product, a wallet, a service can just connect to it and know that they can transact and settle with any counterparty directly on the internet and do that at the speed of the internet and do that with the, uh, the increasing cost efficiency of doing that as well. So in order to make that work, you not only need the, the, the protocol itself, but you also need to take an existing you know, uh, representation of money, like you know, uh, US treasuries, cash on deposited banks, or even central bank money, and um, pre-issue essentially a digital currency representation of that that then can be transacted over these kinds of protocols. So a stable coin is essentially that. A stable coin is both the representation of some asset that exists in the quote unquote real world, like liabilities of banks or central banks or what have you. And it represents that as a digital token that is um, able to be exchanged over a protocol like, like USDC. So it's, it's, it's sort of bringing what we are, you know, know, know from our, 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 our sort of life of interacting with the internet and bringing that to money. Um, now, there are many different ways that you can do this. We chose to build a model that operated under the same regulatory framework that applies to all of the kind of electronic um, payment innovations that we've seen over the past 10 to 20 years, like PayPal or Square or Stripe. So electronic stored value money transmission, as it's called here in the US and other parts of the world, it's called e-money. But basically, it's a electronic money payment system innovation. That's how we chose to, to do this from the start. That was a clear regulatory framework. And under that, you know, we are required by law to basically ensure that at all times, every electronic money representation, just like your, your PayPal balance, if you think about that, you don't really think twice about what the PayPal balance is. You know that you can send it and receive it, and it's always a dollar. So the same kind of model exists for an asset-backed dollar stablecoin uh, like USDC. I mean, it's booming. I mean, you you started the uh, um, 2020 USDC in circulation was about 400 million. Uh, it went up 10x um, to around 4 billion. Uh, it's likely to grow again, 10x. Um, what what is the key to the rapid growth, Jeremy? But then also, what is the total addressable market? Where do you where do you see it going? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start with the total addressable market. Our view is that you know, fiat digital currency models, dollar digital currencies, eventually pound, euro, yen, you know, peso, you name it. But let's just say dollar digital currencies to start here. Our belief is that it is a superior form of electronic money. It is you know, dollars with the superpowers of the internet. Um, and as a superior form of electronic money, it can take share away from existing forms of electronic money. Today, the predominant form of electronic money is privately issued by commercial banks, what I call ACH money. And um, you, know, you're, 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 you have an electronic record with a bank, and that's essentially an IOU against the, 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 the lending book uh, and liabilities of the bank. So that's one form of electronic money. Um, the, the, the market size of M2 commercial bank electronic money is, I, I believe, over $100 trillion today. And so my own view is, you know, if you look at the internet, there's sort of like the 10% rule. And the 10% rule is, you know, after roughly 10 years, uh, you know, internet markets might be 10% of the market. Um, uh, so my, my belief essentially is that over the next 10 years, I think that dollar digital currencies like this can be many trillions 
in, in value. And the thing, the thing to, to note about this is like other internet technologies, um, you know, things like a, a stable coin are, are network effects businesses. Money is a network effects business itself, but, but something like a stable coin is a network effects business. The more people who have it, the more utility it has, the more utility it has, the more people that want to transact in it. And what we found, which is really interesting about USDC, is that the, the amount in circulation continues to grow. There's a huge amount that's issued. There's a huge amount that's redeemed. The amount of issuance to redemption is roughly two to one. And so what that roughly means is that there's been, let's call it, you know, 65, 66, 70 billion USDC issued, and then it's redeemed. People, that's part of the utility is you can always redeem it for a dollar. But the net circulation grows because it inherently holds utility. And people want to stay in it because it has higher utility value for them than uh, ACH money. And, and I think a lot of people experience this. So like once you start transacting with something like USDC, you're like, why the fuck would I ever use a wire? Why, why would I ever? You know, it's just insanely better. It's that 10x user experience. So I think that that's part of what's contributing to growth. And then obviously, like the rapid growth of digital assets as a whole, the rapid growth of decentralized finance is, you know, is growing. Um, all, all these things are contributing to the amount of growth in circulation and usage. Is Bitcoin worthless? I don't think so. Uh, I, I'm very much uh, in, in, in the view that non-sovereign digital commodity money plays a really important role in the international monetary system, will grow in importance, um, I, I would expect, over time. A very significant number of governments will uh, will will hold Bitcoin as a reserve asset. I think um, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, t- to me, a, a a a sound money that is not controlled by any particular corporation or government that has a uh, you know a, a fixed supply is digitally scarce, secure, private, uh, and decentralized is an extraordinary innovation. And is likely to continue to to grow, and it, not just Bitcoin. I think, I think Ether, for example, is a is also an extraordinary innovation in in non sovereign digital commodity money as well. And I think you know this category of, of monetary instrument, I, I suspect, will be larger and larger uh, over time. So. When did you have your eureka moment about what you just said? Uh, did you always feel that way the day that Bitcoin was invented? Or did something happen to you, Jeremy, where you said, wait, wait, wait a minute, there's something here yeah. that I really need to acknowledge and understand? Yeah, you know, it was it was really when I when I first started going down the crypto rabbit hole in in um, in 2012. And, and, you know, I think I got deeper and deeper conviction the more time I spent on it. And I think, um, you know, part, part of that was from, you know, and look, I'm like an armchair academic, you know, uh, uh, economist. Like, I, I'm not a trained economist. I don't, you know, so if you pretty much every trained economist that you ask thinks it's a complete joke um, with rare exceptions, uh, which probably tells you you're onto something. But, um, I, you know, I, I think um, in, in all seriousness, um, I, you know, following the financial crisis uh, of 2008, 2009, there were really legitimate questions to be asked about the nature of central bank money, the, the, uh, the, the role of a non-sovereign form of money. You could kind of go back in time and, and look at the underlying basis for even fiat money being, you know, pegged to a non-sovereign store of value. Um, but you know, I, I think even prior to, to my interest in, in crypto, um, you know, I was I was, you know, an avid reader of uh, of Austrian economics, of von Hayek, uh, you know, um, and, and and you know, I think have always just been in, interested in in um, you know competition in in currency. Um, and you know, looking at the history of money, it's clear that uh, you know that there's always significant competition. And I think uh, the world and people and firms um, and households generally, I think, are attracted to something that is not you know tied to a sovereign. 
Um, and, and I think in today's world, it's a global complex world. Um, you know, people, people are, are more interested in that. Um, and I think that will continue to grow. You know, and obviously we, we agree, I, I, but I think the more brilliant thing that you've done with Circle is you've more or less made Circle a bridge between traditional finance and what, let's call it decentralized finance. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the Circle model. Of course, it yeah. includes the stable coin, which you've eloquently explained, but what are the other elements of the Circle model that you're executing? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think... Um, there, there are a couple of, of, of key pieces. That, you know, the, the first, which we talked a little bit about, is, is USDC, and 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 we're kind of principal operator of that, and we look at that as essentially like a, a market infrastructure. It's almost like a market utility, and we want to make it as easy as possible for as many institutions as possible to be able to utilize it uh, to have really strong interoperability between the existing kind of uh, financial system and and that pure digital currency. Um, representation and digital currency rails. So operating that, scaling that is a is a huge effort, um, and, uh, and 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 is growing and is growing a big ecosystem. The second piece, though, is um, we really believe that um, more and more companies around the world are going to want to bank, if you will, in digital currency. That they're going to want to have the equivalent of a, a, a corporate commercial bank type product. They're going to want to have the equivalent of a transaction bank like product, which is natively in a digital currency world, but has seamless interoperability with the existing financial system. So the circle account is really the tip of the spear that gives a business the ability to take advantage of the payment utility of something like USDC. Um, but increasingly, we're providing a whole series of other services that we monetize. So that includes um, you know, what we call our API services, but you can basically think of that as, you know, you want to wire up traditional credit cards or bank transfers into an application and have it all natively settle and transact in the USDC. We give you a set of services to do that. You could be a fintech, a startup, a crypto firm, uh, a commerce firm, and, and you'll pay us on a, on a usage basis for those transaction services. We're also introducing what we broadly define as treasury services, which is effectively providing ways to uh, providing ways for for businesses to um, take dollars or USDC that may they may already have and lend it through Circle out into an institutional borrowing market where you're generating uh, high yields. And so that is a, a product that we have in what we call early access. It's going to be more widely available. Um, as, as we go forward. Um, but we think lots and lots of businesses, whether you're uh, an asset allocator or you're just a, a corporate treasurer, are going to want to get um, exposure to digital asset markets in a dollar denominated fixed rate, fixed term type of you know, fi fixed income kind of product. And so we're offering that. So it's treasury services, uh, almost like cash management in the context of digital currency. And, and so that's another piece. And and we think is going to grow to be quite large um, and, and, and part of a bigger ecosystem that 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 um, we're, we're all kind of part of. And then, you know, finally, we have a fundraising platform uh, where people can raise capital for selling securities directly on the Internet called Seed Invest. We have a lot of ideas about how that can become more digital asset native. We think that more and more direct capital formation is going to happen on the Internet and is going to happen using things like tokens. Uh, and so we have we have a, a vision for how that evolves as well. But you know, think of Circle as building kind of a suite of, you know, commercial, commercial bank like transaction bank like services, as well as supporting this overall market infrastructure for stable coins. So I, I'm going to turn it over to the uh, very successful questioner, John Darcy, in a second. Okay, uh, but I got to ask another question related to Circle's future. Um, I see you as an ambassador, Jeremy. I see you as somebody, um, not to use a, a turn of phrase, but a stable pair of hands operating a stable coin. Mm -hmm. And I see you as somebody that could win over the likes of a, of a Jamie Dimon or a Larry Fink. And so let's pretend that we had both Jamie and Larry in this room with us here on Zoom on this Salt Talk. 
What would you say to them about what they could potentially be missing about the future of decentralized finance? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's pretty straightforward, which is that the technology of of, of crypto um, as a technology and these sort of public network infrastructures that are being built up around it represent as significant of an infrastructure upgrade to the internet as the web was, as the smartphone was. These are very, very powerful general purpose infrastructures that for the first time ever give us an opportunity to more safely um, uh, enable economic activity to happen directly on the internet, economic and financial activity to be happening directly on the internet. And so I look at this as the beginning of the development of the new economic infrastructure of the world. Um, Just like the internet became the new infrastructure of information and communications and data. This is the beginning of the new of a new infrastructure development for economic activity and governance activity in the world. And so it's that big. It's going to create many trillion dollar companies over time. And gradually, the business of banking and asset management and um, investing and the utility value that comes alongside all that it will migrate to this new economic infrastructure. And if you want to be involved in that, you got to get involved in that. (laughs) Um, And I think the, I think the instinct that large players have is, is one that, you know, the existing financial system is tightly controlled, tightly managed. It's a, 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 it's, it's a very closed infrastructure model. And I think it's, taking some lessons from the rest of the internet in terms of, you know, telecommunications used to be a closed, permissioned, tightly regulated, controlled infrastructure environment. Um, Media, television, other things tended to be controlled, tightly regulated infrastructure models. And so the natural progression is for these infrastructures to be open, global, interoperable, internet native, and, and, and that's what's sort of taking place right now. And so my, 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 my ultimate message is, um, it, you know, this is something that firms like BlackRock and JP Morgan should be actively involved in, not just saying, oh, we like the technology, we don't like the, the crypto or what have you, which is just nonsense. So I think it's, you know, committing to building an open internet of value and being part of a new open global economic system that's built entirely on the internet. You know, it's it's interesting when I hear them talk, I hear my own voice and my own thoughts and words from 2014 and 15. And so I'm just wondering if the rock will land on their head or the apple will land on their head where they have that eureka moment there They say, wait a minute, I may have this wrong. I may not be sizing this appropriately. Uh, With that, I'm going to turn it over to John Darcy, Jeremy, and uh, thanks again for your participation at our live event. Uh, and we want to get you back. Hopefully, you'll come to Abu Dhabi with us or uh, be back in North America next year. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Anthony. Jeremy, here comes the fun part. So, um, when Anthony was talking about a safe pair he's of just hands, a I thought- rude, uh, on top of everything else, I mean, he's good looking. And somebody <laughs> told me that he was like an 80s matinee novel uh, uh, idol and was ready to throw <laughs> up. Okay. Despite all that, okay, he's also a smart Alec. Okay. Keep going, Darcy. Go ahead. All right. When Anthony remember, was talking about bonus, a safe pair of hands, remember your bonus gets paid out. It's two months from your bonus. Okay, that's just fair. Be careful. That's fair. I got to okay? I got to tone it down a little bit. All right. But um, in terms of being a safe pair of hands, I thought Anthony was going a different direction uh, with that. To ask you about tether. So anybody who pays any attention to the fud, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the crypto marketplace has heard of tether as a big source of that. It's a very controversial asset. Uh, it was recently on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week. Another sort of rehashing of you know, the similar similar doubts that people have expressed around Tether's reserves and their general opacity that they operate with. Um, one, do you think Tether is a systemic risk? Are you concerned at all about their, uh, you know, lack of transparency around their reserves? And how has Circle, more importantly, gone about their business uh, differently than Tether has in terms of 
breeding trust, transparency, all those types of things. Yeah. You know, I, I think, um, I, 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 I don't, I don't know that, that tether itself is a systemic risk. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the, the crypto asset markets are $2 trillion plus markets and the, the tether market cap is, you know, $68 billion of that. Um, and, you know, there are really strong um, alternatives that that exist, and um, yeah, we happen to operate one of them. I think, um, you know, when 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 we um, conceptualized uh, USDC actually four years ago, when we were kind of putting together the ideas, interestingly, from our perspective, we weren't looking at, at Tether as a competitor. Um, we were we were really focused on. Um, much of what I described earlier in the conversation, which is how do we create a standard that is is trusted, that is a standard that people can build on, that is is really focused on trying to actualize this this vision of you know a, a protocol for dollars on the internet. And our our view is always that you know if if you do this right, it could actually become something that you know hundreds of thousands of businesses are building on. That it's used widely in in every form of payments and commerce and finance, and the use cases would be as broad as you know a dollar on the internet. You can imagine it being useful in in, in an incredibly broad range of ways. Now, the initial kind of what I call the bootstrap use case for for something like USDC was um, you know providing a a, a strong um, dollar settlement option for the digital asset markets. Um, that definitely is sort of where the market was three years ago when when this was introduced. And I think USDC grew relatively quickly um, relative to any other regulated kind of do- dollar dollar stable coin um, because it had you know strong companies behind it on the institutional and retail side. It was liquid, it was redeemable, it was regulated, it was transparent. We always you know work, worked with um, you know we've you know, state banking examiners that, you know, examine us all the time. It's defined under a, a very clear regulatory structure. Um, a major global public accounting firm is auditing not just Circle, but also attesting every month to to the, the full reserve nature. And so we went out of our way to really try and set a bar that was higher um, and then work with the developer community on 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 how to, how to support and adopt it. And so I think um, the market has just sort of spoken for itself. I mean, I think at the beginning of 2020, we we might have been, you know, I don't know, five percent or eight percent of 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 tether. We're now approaching fifty percent. Um, and you know, when I think about the use cases, coming back to use cases again, when you imagine, you know, a Visa or a Mastercard or a MoneyGram or a major e-commerce firm or a major global fintech or a financial institution deciding to start using stablecoin, it's pretty clear uh, that they're going to focus on doing something that is within the the, the regulated supervision of, of, of the U.S. banking system uh, that has a you know, really strong track record of compliance uh, and transparency and security and other things. But that's, that's what people are going to use. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm also one to, to say, you know, Tether has immense utility. And um, a, a lot of a lot of the growth for Tether, um, you know, ha, has come from you know the offshore Chinese exchanges, from the yuan to to, to crypto trade, um, which you know I think established itself very very deeply with you know peer to peer over the counter markets in China, where people just would load up on Tether, um, and, and so that that's obviously a huge source of 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 of, of growth there, and we, we don't really play there. Um, and uh, and so that kind of offshore Chinese, uh, you know, dollar crypto trade um, or yuan to crypto trade really, um, uh, you know, is significant, and you can't discount that. And and that's not just going to go away, even if right. the Chinese, even if the Chinese government wants to basically make it go away, it's not going to. It's not just going to go away. So, Jeremy, you talked about remittance as cross-border remittance as one use case for something like stable coins. Uh, you know, sort of an aha moment that I had around things like remittance happened when Strike was leveraging the Bitcoin network for, you know, in El Salvador is the most high profile case. But 
also basically just putting dinosaurs like Western Union that take a huge chunk of people's money that they're sending, whether it's from Mexico to the United States or from El Salvador to the United States or all around the world is the use case for stable coins or, or cryptocurrencies for remittance. How are things like stable coins and other digital currencies driving down the cost of remittance, the delivery of global aid you've talked about uh, in the media, on social media? And, and how do you solve those problems without running afoul of things like AML, KYC type regulatory issues? Yeah. So the, the, the first thing I'd say on this is that it's happening. Um, and it's happening with, I think, I- I- increasing speed. Um, and you know, one of the really exciting things about, about USDC that we've seen over the past two years in particular is because it's, it's sort of an open standard anyone can connect to, it's just like a, pu- a published protocol that anyone can connect to, hundreds of different wallets, exchanges, et cetera, around the world have connected to it. And so effectively what's happened is organically, we've seen a global internet native dollar settlement rail just come kind of come alive that can reach countries everywhere. And um, I actually, I, I have my own podcast called Money Movement. I did an episode a while ago, which basically was showing uh, how you could have USDC go around the world uh, and interact with local currency models and go entirely around the world in 45 minutes. And, and literally, it's a USDC from a business to a contractor in London that the person in London sticks some of it into a DeFi contract to earn some yield, has to pay uh, a, a, a friend back for travel, sends it to USDC to a person in Korea. They receive the USDC. They're able to convert it instantly into won and have it you know, in, into a Korean bank account. Um, that person then, you know, sends the a, a remaining amount of USDC uh, on to a, uh, you know, a, a, a software contractor in Argentina. The USDC arrives again in minutes, is able to convert it into local peso or into Mercado Pago, which is the the, the sort of Amazon of Latin America. Um, and you know, and and then uh, and then they you know sort of spend it at a marketplace in um, in. In, in Asia, where the seller on the marketplace is from India, they redeem the USDC into, a, into a, a, a wallet in India and convert it into rupee and have it in, in the local Indian bank account in like 15 seconds. All this stuff is real. It actually works. You can move dollars at the speed of the internet. There are now services that are crypto native that are exchanges and wallets in markets around the world that can convert between USDC and local currencies. And generally, all of these firms are doing it at like the interbank mid rate. They're not. They're not trying to build a lot of FX spread because they're. They're a lot of their businesses is really trying to drive people to be you know investing on their platforms and things like that. And so you, you kind of have this kind of organic thing happening. It's pretty cool to watch. Another example is Mexico. There's an amazing company, huge growth. Um, uh, you know, called Bitso. It has tremendous backers. They're they're in Mexico and Brazil. They're regulated. They've got a great reputation. But like USDC to Mexican peso, you can do it in like in minutes, and you can go from you know USDC to MXN, and then through the RTGS, the real time gross settlement system in Mexico, get it in a Mexican bank account in seconds. This is the fastest, cheapest way to get money to Mexico. And Bitso, the volume they're seeing. Um, they have said is 10% of the cross-border flows between uh, b- between the U.S. and Mexico. That's pretty profound. Um, and so I think we're we're at the very beginning of this phenomenon. Um, as I have said for many many years, I believe that the phrase uh, cross-border payments will become uh, like an absurd phrase, just like it's just absurd to say, have you sent a cross-border email lately or had a cross-border web browsing session? I mean, the whole concept is just like ridiculous in the context of the internet. And so I think the whole idea of a cross-border payment would just disappear um, in in a number of years. And and the cost will just continue to plummet down to to close to zero. So I think that's going to return very real value to people and the real economy um, and you know it, it'll unlock a lot of new things, um, and, and it'll move us into this this realm of of you know digital currency native commerce and finance, um, which is really where the the latent power of all of this lies. 
Right. Anthony was talking about, you know, what's the promise of DeFi? And that's the way I try to explain it to people in very simple terms is that you're just removing so many toll takers that, you know, while it might hurt certain companies, it's going to create so much value to people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, whether it be, you know, Mexican-Americans sending money back to their family, people in El Salvador, all across the world, people are going to be able to keep more of what they earn and, and send it to people in a more efficient way. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that's right on. I mean, like the, the you know, I, I, I have this phrase I use of, of the idea of long tail capital markets. And, you know, the Internet's really, really good at creating marketplaces, multi-sided marketplaces where uh, a very, very long tail of participants can, can be involved. You're like, you know, Google created long tail advertising platforms. eBay originally was like a long tail marketplace, but Amazon and Alibaba, any seller anywhere can reach any buyer anywhere, super efficient. You've got, you know, long tail content platforms. You have all these. We now, we have the opportunity to have internet native long tail capital markets. And that's profound because it means that everyone in the world will be able to participate in capital formation, savings and investing in a multi-sided way. The difference is Web3 as a model is a decentralized model. And so the capital markets themselves will just increasingly just be machines on the internet that people are right. interacting with. Well, it's a good transition to talk about Web3, which again, we, we dive deep into some topics related to crypto, but we also have a lot of people in the SALT community that are less familiar with some of these buzzwords and what they mean. And Web3 is something that you know, if you're on social media or you read about digital assets that you hear a lot about, about the massive promise that Web3 presents. Um, could you explain to people in your own words, what is Web3 and why is it so exciting? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, earlier on, I was talking about how when I look at this technology, I, I, I think about, you know, crypto and blockchains as really just like an upgrading of the, the, the fundamental infrastructure of the internet. And when you when you look at the way the internet's evolved, you had web one, um, w w which was very, very limited. It was sort of um, one to many was the sort of model. And then you had web two, which you know was sort of anchored in the many to many model, uh, social media being a, a huge representation of that. Anyone could publish, anyone could share information. You had you know many to many interactions. But the actual technical architecture of the web, the technical architecture of the internet, um, basically tended towards centralization. And it tended towards these many-to-many -many platforms actually being controlled by centralized entities like Facebook, like Google, like Apple. Um, and you know, that's, that's had a lot of potentially significant or demonstrably significant negative consequences, erosions of privacy, large honeypots of data, over you know, extreme levels of market power. Um, and it's something that you know, government's concerned about. They're thinking about it from a regulatory perspective. I think the internet is responding. And, and, and crypto and blockchain is the internet's response. It is it is, you know, as I talked about earlier, like there's an inherent DNA in the internet of decentralization and of these open networks. And I think the internet wants that to be the case. And I think society wants that to be the case. So Web3 is literally building on a more decentralized infrastructure that puts users and communities in more control over data, over information, over economic value and the exchange of value. And it, it shifts from a centralized model to a decentralized model. And it, it's profound. I think it's very profound. I think, um, you know, there's some amazing, you know, you know, examples out there. If you think about protocols that exist on these decentralized networks where the protocol itself is operated by a decentralized autonomous organization of stakeholders that are governing it entirely in software on the internet. There's no corporation. There's just this, this code and, and these stakeholders and it's cryptographically provable kind of ownership and governance. And you know, a, a DAO like the Uniswap uh, protocol is one of the biggest exchanges in the world. Um, that's amazing. Uh, you know, a, a DAO like the Axie Infinity 
um, you know, game platform is phenomenal. It's created a labor market. It's created a digital goods market. It's created a, a, a market capitalization that is as big as the biggest game companies. And that's happened in like a couple of years. Yep. Um, so I believe, you know, Web3 will create in many, many categories, everything from cloud services to, uh, to, to, to entertainment, to social media, to communications, to, um, you know, finance, obviously, in all these categories, will create on-chain entities, these new types of corporate forms that are bigger than the, many of the biggest companies in the world. And that's profound. And I think it's accelerating. And so that's a huge opportunity for, for, for the world. And I, and I think at the end of the day, what does it really mean? It means an internet that, um, you know, puts individuals in, in, in more control um, versus these like, you know, centralized, uh, you know, centralized platforms that are so concerning to so many people. Yeah, I mean, as I've gone down the NFT rabbit hole, which is sort of the the next question that I have for you, it's it's fascinating how natural it feels in terms of the evolution of things like art and gaming to be uh, on blockchain rails, to be governed by uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, as you mentioned. I'm a big fan of Solana personally, and I uh, yeah. about a month ago started diving into the Solana NFT ecosystem, uh, which has been a lot of fun. Um, what do you think the ultimate promise of NFTs is? Is it purely a manifestation of sort of the future of art and and uh, collecting things like art? Or do you think the promise of NFTs is much greater? And talked about gaming like Axie. I'm a big fan of the Aurori project, for example, yeah. on Solana. Um, can you talk about your view on NFTs? Are they a fad? Are they a bubble? And what's the ultimate promise of NFTs? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think a, 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 any given sort of... Uh, Di digital art uh, phenomenon, right, is, is sort of, um, and, and the market value is obviously highly speculative and subjective. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as interested in that per se, although it's fascinating. I do look at NFTs though, as I, I, I kind of talk about these like building block primitives. NFTs are a very significant generalized primitive that can be applied to a ton of different use cases and scenarios. Um, it happens to be that the sort of digital collectibles um, and 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 digital creative expression um, have been the the sort of first wave of of how that happens. But I think this is a a fundamentally it's a huge upgrade in how intellectual property creators can um, can reward and incentivize and monetize their work and the, 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 the shared communities of interest around their work. Um, and I think it, it will touch every form of, of digital intellectual property. And in fact, it is the first the sort of, we had DRM technology that was sort of like more of a security technology, but NFTs are uh, really a, a, a fundamental way to express digital intellectual property. So I, I think that, the use cases of that are, are, are very, very profound, but it, it's interesting because years ago, we talked about the tokenization of everything, how property in the world would be tokenized, how your lawnmower could be tokenized, people could have it in the sharing economy and could you know, borrow and lend against it and all kinds of whatever. Um, I, still, I still think that's all true. I still think we're on a road to that. Interestingly, you know, property like a car, a house, stock in a company, um, are all non-fungible tokens. They're, they're, they're all just forms of non-fungible tokens. Right. It's just that, 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 that layer of jurisprudence and the existing legal framework around property and financial transactions around property, that's a beast. Um, it's a beast. And people have tried to break through that beast to tokenize things. And it's been hard. Eventually, it will happen. Just you know, It will just happen. Um, but the low friction of doing tokenization of digital intellectual property um, has, has actually been where that started first. And so I think NFTs in today's world are you know, a, a, a very, very significant phenomenon that can be applied um, and, and, and can be applied in creative ways when you're seeing this, where a musician is selling an NFT, which gives you entitlements. It gives you the content, it gives you the, the the rights to a certain creative output, but it gives you entitlements to participate in a community. I mean, obviously, Anthony 
launched his NFT product at Salt. And it was about the entitlements. Yeah, you got the bottle of whiskey or whatever it was, but you got entitlements and you can prove the ownership of those entitlements. And so we're going to see a lot of really creative things from mainstream brands and products and services that start to utilize that. And so this really is in some ways, you know, a killer app category that will bring, you know, crypto technology into, into more mainstream hands. Well, Jeremy, it's a pleasure to have you on. There's so many other topics we could go into, and you've done such a good job explaining them in a way uh, that offers depth, but also, you know, is, is understandable for the average person. You know, one of the, the interesting things that we can talk about next time we have you on, and I'd love to have you on again, is, is seed invest and creating yeah. secondary markets for startups and democratization of investing in private Absolutely. companies, I think is a no brainer. You know, I know we have a mutual, uh, somebody, a mutual friend or mutual acquaintance that securitize and things they're yes. doing to tokenize uh, startups and things of that nature. I think the sky is the limit for how we can use these technologies, as you alluded to in the opening, to just democratize the industry yeah. um, and all that type of stuff. But thanks again for, for uh, being at SALT. Your panel with Sam Bankman-Fried, Anatoly Yakovenko from, uh, from Solana was fantastic. If you guys haven't watched that on YouTube, I would highly recommend that you watch that. And it's been a pleasure having you on SALT Talks as well. Thank you so much, John. Really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Jeremy Allaire from Circle Financial. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT Talks, including all the panels from SALT New York, we made a strategic decision several years ago to start opening uh, the, the lid on the content that we uh, produce at our conferences for people to watch after the event. So I would highly recommend you watch that panel with Jeremy, with Sam Bankman fried from FTX and Anatoly uh, from Solana. You'll learn a lot there as well, all on our YouTube channel and on our website at salt.org backslash talks is where you can access all of these salt talks. Uh, please also spread the word about these salt talks. We love educating people. I think, again, this one in particular, Jeremy did a great job of talking about DeFi in ways that your, your uncle, who's a crypto skeptic, uh, can even understand. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.